Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk with Raphael Resendez, co-founder of the Applied Finance Group. From Raphael's views on systematic value investing and how some value investing strategies may have lost their way, to the way he thinks about investing in stock selection through his firm's proprietary intrinsic value framework, which uses economic margin as a key input through a model they've been running in real time over 25 years, I think you'll find this to be a very thoughtful and sensible conversation around disciplined value investing and modeling. Thanks so much. We hope you enjoy this discussion with Raphael Resendis. Raphael, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. We really enjoyed the Bloomberg uh, Odd Lots interview, and we'll probably hit on some of the same material, but we're going to try to vary it up uh, too for you. Um, one of the things that's, I think, great about what we try to do with this podcast is we like to hear sort of different viewpoints than maybe where we're coming from. Um, I mean, we we do run some what I would consider traditional, maybe systematic value models. And so they're very different than what you and your firm has created, which is very interesting. We're going to talk about, um, but that's why it's going to be good. I think to hear your viewpoints on value investing, systematic investing, your intrinsic value framework, and sort of maybe some other points around portfolio construction that um, we'll get into. But to start, I thought it would be good if we could um, reference and just talk through four critiques that you had in one of your papers around sort of traditional quantitative value investing, which is maybe just generally defined as some you know strategies using these simple valuation metrics like price to book or, or other price based um, metrics like PE or something like that. So we wanted just to read you. I'm going to take the first two points and I'll let you comment on those. And then Jack will take number three and four and sort of just walk through some of these arguments around the way we, we might want to be thinking around traditional quant value. All right. So to start, number one, um, quantitative value investing has no identity. While it began with a central idea to identify securities mispriced relative to book value, it has devolved into a factor hunt with no unifying theory to guide its development. Right. So if we go back to sort of how this entire field began, going back to the Fama French's three-factor model that they unveiled, I believe, in 92, right? They looked at data from 63 to 91. From their, from their work, they concluded book to price was probably the preeminent factor to explain uh, cross-sectional returns in conjunction with size and the overall market effect. And it's hard to argue with that evidence in terms of the, the data they laid out as evidence. It's hard to argue with that simply because from 63 to 91, book to price performed extraordinarily well. If you look at the returns to a, a, a book to price strategy, it was basically a money-making machine. The problem is since this went live, book to price has had a very different performance reality. And we lay some of this data out in, in the paper. I think you're referencing quantitative values broken. Uh, there's a couple charts in there that show how book to price performed pre-91 and then how it's performed post-91. And the problem with the post-91 period has not just been the underperformance of book to price. If you actually regressed the value factor against the market, you, you'd end up with a negative loading on the coefficient. But what's happened since then was this this search to basically fix it. So Fama French came out with their five-factor model in 2015, and to it they added uh, profitability and investment. And when they did that, book to price essentially became more or less uh, an insignificant variable at that point. We can we'll dive into the Fama French aspects of their their two variables to kind of and what they were trying to do, but since then. You've also had momentum added, you've had volatility added. So what started off as this uh, this approach within a risk management framework and a risk story, book to price, high book to price stocks are riskier, has sort of devolved into let's find factors that can lead to alpha that outperform the market. Fama French attempted to do it by adding profitability and the investment factor. They laid out the, the, the concept of working from a dividend discount model 
And when they looked at holding factors constant and they changed profitability or they changed investment, they came up with a hypothesis for a sign on expected returns. And the sign they came up with profitability was positive and in fact the data proved them right. The sign they came up with for investment was negative and the data proved them right, but I think their approach was really uh, poorly specified in the sense of they created a valuation model where all future investments didn't generate any additional cash flow. So they basically concluded high growth companies lead to negative expected returns. They lead to negative subsequent stock returns. What they missed in the entire specification was this concept of wealth creation. A company generating returns in excess of its cost of capital has a very different stock return profile than a company with a return below its cost of capital. And when you add growth to the, to the mix, it just compounds the difference. So by saying growth is a negative variable, you're essentially saying my worldview is tilting away from McDonald's, Walmart, Pfizer, Target, Microsoft, Intel, um, Facebook, Google, Apple. It's a worldview tilted away from basically, arguably, the best returning companies in the history of the stock market. I think that's really problematic. And so from an identity perspective, I don't think quantitative value investing represents value any longer. As I say, I believe it's devolved into a, a factor hunt to identify these are factors that create alpha. And there's nothing wrong with that. But as a firm that specialized in doing valuations and focusing on intrinsic value for the last 25 plus years, we want to reclaim the word value to make it represent what it really should mean. You know, factor investing book to price really isn't a value metric. It's a cheapness metric. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think some of that history that you just shared with us probably has to do with the next point, which is around, you know, the evidence standard. And this is from your paper. The evidence standard used in quantitative value studies is low quality, consisting of observations subject to look ahead bias and data snooping with poor out of sample results. So you kind of hit on some of that there, but I just didn't know if you wanted to maybe add on to anything with that critique. Sure. Just just briefly, um, I don't want to continue beating this horse, but I think it is problematic to say I'm looking at, at an effect or a phenomenon in the past, even if I don't have malintent, and I don't, I don't ascribe malintent to any of these research papers, but you sort of know how history has played out. And if, and if you're in the markets and you're following financial news all the time and you're a stock junkie, you sort of know what's happened to the economy at different stages through history and how the market has played out through different stages through history. And I think it's a very different standard, and I, I don't think I'm unique in my view. Campbell Harvey wrote a paper with a number of co-authors basically saying the gold standard for research is live out of sample data. All the data that tends to be used to justify these studies and presented as evidence is all known. You know, it's, it's, it's done looking backward. Book to price, since it became live, and there may be other reasons for it, don't get me wrong, but since it became live, has not performed nearly as well as it performed when this model was first calibrated. And that's a point that we make over and over. You know, we haven't presented our data in this format for 25 years simply because we thought it was important to gather the data and have enough data because it's gonna be a questionable or controversial statement when we make it that you really need to go to live out of sample data to, to have a evidence as opposed to an observation. We, we calibrated our valuation models in 95 using data from 1970 to 1995. I wouldn't consider any of our findings over that time period to be evidence per se, right? I mean, we knew inflation was high in the 70s. Uh, we knew cost of capital was dropping after Volcker got inflation under control. We saw what was happening to tax rates and implied cost of capital. What to us is interesting is we created a set of theories and an approach to valuing a company that we thought worked. Unfortunately, when we really started producing it consistently in 98, we ran into the tech bubble and literally people thought we were insane. I mean, we had a we had an intrinsic value for Cisco of 14 or $15 a share when it was at 80. And, you know, we sent out this report to people and literally the some of the replies we got back were, you guys deserve to be out of business. You guys are idiots. And I, I don't doubt the fact that we're idiots. I kind of actually agree with that point, but I think we deserve to be in business. 
<laughs> so I just think there's a big difference between actually taking the time and putting together a live out of sample view of whatever theory you have versus just relying on a backward looking observation period. Yeah, I, th I think your point's a really good one because it's very hard to unknow what you already know. And so, for example, if I'm testing an investment strategy right now that starts in 1980, I know in the back of my mind that rates plummeted from 1980 to now. I know we didn't experience high inflation. So even if I'm not trying to, I'm probably going to test strategies that I, you know, knowing what happened in that environment. And so I, th I think your point's a really good one that it it's very, very hard to unknow that stuff um, or to take it out of your head. And, you know, you can't foresee a tech boom and a tech crash. You can't foresee an Asian crisis. You can't foresee a great recession that's bringing down some of the biggest investment houses in the world. You can't foresee a pandemic. I mean, these are things that Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan till you're punched in the face. These economic shocks are the punches to the face to any model. You know, you can see them in the past. You don't know what the next shock's gonna be. We're very, you know, we're very grateful that we had the confidence and we feel that we laid out a comprehensive enough approach that makes enough economic sense that was, has been able to withstand these types of shocks through time. Your, your third point was around the investment factor. And, you know, the investment factor could be a very hard one for investors to understand because it's this idea that when you invest in your business, it's a bad thing um, is, you know, is, is something that quantitative research has looked at, but your average investor has a tough time understanding that. I wanted to read you um, from one of the blogs we follow. I wanted to read you a defense of the investment factor and just have you comment on how, how you disagree with this and why you, you know, think maybe the, the research and the investment factor is flawed. Um, it says firms with lower discount rates, lower cost of capital, and thus lower expected returns invest more. Firms with higher discount rates, higher cost of capital, and thus higher expected returns face higher hurdles for investment and thus invest less. In other words, investment predicts, predicts returns because given expected profitability, high cost of capital imply low net present value of net capital and low investment, and low cost of capital imply high net present value of new capital and high investment. Thus, all else equal, firms with higher investment should earn lower expected returns than firms with lower investment. What do you think about that? I mean, so everybody has these time varying cost of capitals and then they're going to change their capital structure and their business plans as their cost of capital is changing. I mean, intuitively, I disagree. Net present value, I think returns dominate cost of capital, right? There are companies that have very high rates of return and good reinvestment opportunities and companies that have really crappy ones. And the, the, the the spread around return, rates of return on investment are much higher than the spread around company cost of capital. Cost of capital generally is not wagging the investment dog tail, right? It's, did Amazon have a super low cost of capital when it was starting out and growing at 50% a year or now? When is Amazon more risky? Now or, or 20 years ago? It was growing a lot more in the past the cost of capital argument would say Amazon's growth should be exploding now, right? Because <laughs> when is it more risky now? You know, Coca-Cola, should Coca-Cola, when, when was it more risky now or 30 years ago as it was setting up the bottlers and really expanding? I, I just think that that argument is nonsensical. I think the reason the investment factor works is because companies with returns below their cost of capital that are growing are horrendous stock performers. And I think there's so much in that space, it drowns out the stocks that are doing well and reinvesting. I mean, I think if you think of, if you think of the investment world, we think of it in terms of wealth creation. We, we kind of think of it as a matrix of four boxes. On the bottom is what we call an economic margin, which is in, in very simple terms, a, a metric we created in 95, but kind of conceptually, it's your ROI minus your cost of capital, right? So you can, you can be positive or negative spread business. And then think of the vertical axis as your reinvestment rate. You can be growing or you can be shrinking. There's three boxes that I can tell you are okay places where you can make money. You can be growing above your cost of capital, you're a compounder, right? You're above your cost of capital, but you're returning cash back to the owners, you're a good steward. You're a negative spread business and you're shrinking. That's your classic turnaround story, right? Where you don't wanna be is a negative spread business that's growing. Bama French, that box is what they captured in all, the, all its glory. They captured that really well. And that box, is, it's a bad box. But if you don't capture the compounders, your worldview towards investing, I think, is just incomplete. That, that would be my, my critique of that, that blurb that you read me. That makes a lot of sense. You're basically saying that that box is distorting a lot of the other, you know, the, the values they're finding. 
Correct. And I, you know, from an academic perspective, uh, a few episodes back where I think you guys were critiquing, not critiquing, but reviewing academic papers, you had a paper by Lu Zhang looking at kind of all the different anomalies, right? Where he, I mean, it, that's an amazing piece of work in terms of the labor that had to go into that. But he's also kind of authored a different school of thought called, called the Q theory, which is a different asset pricing model that he's actually, I think, from an academic perspective, probably the most uh, realistic in terms of being on the right track. And his Q approach captures the interaction of growth and profitability. And I think that's really the right path. My critique of that work is that it doesn't include financials. So, you know, the value literature and, you know, you folks know this well, attractive value stocks, there's a big financial tilt in there. So if you exclude financials, I don't think you can really make a, a robust critique of any value approach just by adding the growth. You have to find a way to bring those back. Our approach kind of includes everybody, so that's why I think it's a little bit of a, it's different than anyone else has attempted uh, in the literature, and I think it, it provides a different set of insights. That, that's a really important point because we talked about this in our interview with Partha Mohanrian, but there's this tendency in all of the academic research to do that, to basically say, here is our model, throw out financials, we'll analyze everything else. You know, you see that a lot in academic papers, and, and you're right. I mean, financials are a big part of the value universe, so that's probably not the best way to, you know, develop a value strategy is just to throw financials out at the beginning, you know, and, and then develop your model. The, the run that we've seen in financial in, in value the last eight, 12 weeks, a big chunk of that has been driven by financials. I mean, it's, you can't have a discussion about value without bellying up to the bar and having a discussion about how, how you're dealing with the financials aspect in terms of how you're constructing a portfolio. And I think another big criticism we have of the whole value literature is it, you know, is it really just a bet on financials? It's a big chunk of it is driven by financial. And another big part of it is driven by small cap firms. You know, you, one of the things that we tried to be very careful of is partition results and look at things small and large. Fama French did a great job, you know, collating data, great job with the statistics. They combined small and large. So we emulated their approach just to kind of have an apples to apples comparison out there. But the conclusions you reach from looking at the small cap value universe versus the large cap value universe are wildly different. And it's almost false advertising to lump them together because you can't just dump tons of money and buy into the small cap space of it, right? It's the big, the large cap space is where you have to invest the bulk of the money system wide. You can't just say I'm a value investor and all these small caps look great and go to a pension fund. You run out of capacity too quickly. And that, that plays to the paper you talked about before, the Replicating Anomalies paper by Lu Zhang, because, you know, he found basically when you threw micro caps out of the sample or you reduced their impact, at least by valuating, you know, a lot of these anomalies went away. Um, so that, that, you know, that sort of supports exactly what you're saying. Um, before we move on to talk about your, your actual model for valuing companies, we want to just touch on your point number four about what's broken with value investing. And that's that uh, quantitative value investing as a discipline suffers from the fundamental research mistake of confusing correlation and causality. I have a table that we can refer to. Uh, a little bit difficult for the for the radio listeners and so on, but we'll, we'll get the material in and collate it in. I think what's really interesting is if you look at well, starting off with the with the notion of intrinsic value, we think of intrinsic value again, kind of boiling it down to a very simplistic model: book value plus the present value of future economic profits. Okay, if economic profits zero, then intrinsic value and book value are the same. So there's going to be some overlap between what an intrinsic model says uh, the company's worth is and book value, specifically to the extent a firm uh, is not earning rates of return above or below its cost of capital, you're more or less going to end up with similar answers. So if we take the universe of stocks that we did for the asset pricing study and you break it up with respect to uh, 30, 40, 30 groupings of stocks, the same way Fama French broke up the data and that we did for the asset pricing study on the basis of book value, and what we call the intrinsic value factor, which is our estimate of, its in, of a stock's intrinsic value relative to its traded price, okay? You, you, so you form nine portfolios. There's two portfolios that has great overlap. Stocks that we say that intrinsic value factor says are undervalued and book to price says are cheap. Those are complementary portfolios. And where the intrinsic value factor says it's expensive and book to price says, or in, intrinsic value says it's undervalued, book to price says it's expensive. Those are also complementary portfolios. 
You look at the alpha of those portfolios and it behaves exactly the way you think it should over the last 25 years. Positive alpha on the undervalued cheap stocks, negative alpha on the undervalued expensive stocks, okay? Now, the interesting piece becomes what happens when we say uh, stocks are undervalued, but from a book to price perspective, they're expensive or they're fairly valued, okay? That group of stocks has significantly positive alpha. What happens to cheap stocks that are expensive or fairly valued? That group of stocks has significantly negative alpha. To us, we understand the special case where book, book value and intrinsic value give very similar messages and similar to how the investment factor had returns dominated from the area of wealth destroyers, book to price benefits a lot from that correlation to intrinsic value. I mean, at the end of the day, the motivation to a large degree for folks to undertake value investing is they want to get something that's below its worth, right? Getting something at a good price, not necessarily cheap. So that's kind of what book, book to value investing, book to price investing is attempting to do. When you strip out undervalued stocks, that metric fails. The exact same thing happens the other way with respect to, you know, expensive book to price stocks and cheap intrinsic value stocks or undervalued intrinsic value stocks. So that's where I get to the correlation piece. Before we get into a little more about your, your model and how you how you value firms, I just want to ask you one more thing about uh, traditional systematic value investing. You know, we, we've talked a lot about book to price and, and a lot of the systematic value investors out there today, you know, are, are agree with you. They're not big believers in book to price, but they use other things, you know, whether it's price to cash flow or EV to EBITDA or something like that. And I'm just wondering, do you think, you know, those suffer from the same flaws as book to price? Um, or, or do you think those are superior ways to sort of represent value? Theoretically, they suffer from the same flaw, which is they're a cheapness measure, not necessarily a measure of intrinsic worth, okay? Executionally, if you form a composite of, say, book to price, price to earnings, price to sales, price to cash flow, the performance is qualitatively similar to what we saw with book to price. When you strip out intrinsic value over and undervalued stocks, those metrics don't do well. And again, those are tables we can denote them and refer them for your reader, have them collated for your readers or listeners or viewers to see. Yeah, we'll put all those in. Um, so let's talk about the specifics behind, I guess, the intrinsic value model that you guys developed. So from my understanding, there's, you know, four components that go into the model. You, and you've kind of touched on some of this already, but you have your economic profitability or your economic margin. You have the asset and capital growth and then um, competition and I guess the protection of the profitability of the firm, if that's how you're looking at it. And then number four is risk. So I was just wondering if you could sort of walk through those four components and just help us understand in a little bit more detail what goes into each of those. And uh, for anybody that has trouble sleeping at night, we have a white paper that describes this in detail. <laughs> go to, nice. at, our, at our website, appliedfinance.com, go to economic margin. You will never have a problem sleeping again. And we do collect royalties on that. So instead of sending it to uh, Lonestra, send your RX subscription prices to us. Very simple. We, Five dollars a download, there you go. no problem. New business model. Um, sure, but but so our view, our worldview is four components basically describe intrinsic value: economic profits, growth, competition, and risk. And so each piece, we going back to when we started our company, Dan O'Bricky and I started in 95. We did, as I mentioned, we did a lot of work looking at data from the 70s, 80s, and early 90s to kind of calibrate our worldview. Economic margin essentially starts off with net income and then add, adds back, you know, back in 95, we realized the world was changing. Um, and this is actually a, a hat tip to Baruch Lev. I saw him, he delivered a workshop at University of Chicago, I think maybe in 1990, where he had a working paper capitalizing intellectual property. And, it, and the rankings, the way he ranked companies after that capitalization exercise, the rankings were so different than any other metric. At that point, it just got me thinking on this whole notion of, of R&D and issues with the accounting system. So we make a number of adjustments to net income. The, the simple ones are, add back interest expense so we get rid of financing, add back depreciation expense to start to move this to cash flow. Since 95, we've been capitalizing R&D, so we add that back. Uh, we've also capitalized operating leases since then, we add that back. And then there's a number of some other other adjustments, but, but you know, in terms of the 90-10 rule, that probably gets you the majority of the way towards our operations-based cash flow 
definition. If you were to apply that to Amazon in 2017, I just, I just gave a presentation yesterday. We're going to pr present to some CFA societies next week, so working through some numbers. If you applied that to Amazon in 2017, I think they had net income of $3 billion, but from our view of the world, their operations-based cash flow is almost $30 billion. So from an accounting perspective, I think there's a lot missing between net income and kind of a, a company's economic ability to generate cash, okay? So that's that's one data point. The next piece is, is really figuring out how much has been invested in the firm. So we start off with net assets because it's kind of like fractions. You gotta have numerator and denominators have to match when you're putting things together. We add back accumulated depreciation. If we have cash flow in the numerator, you want accumulated depreciation in the denominator. We capitalize R&D, we capitalize leases, we also believe it's important to have basically a matching between dollars, the income statements in current dollars, the balance sheets in historic dollars. So we have an inflation adjustment that we bring to the balance sheet. You kind of work through that. Those are the main components to get to what we call gross investment. You apply that to say Apple versus Exxon. 2017, Apple had a larger balance sheet than Exxon. You account for accumulated depreciation, that's property, plant, and equipment that's still in place that the company needs to generate its current cash flow that it hasn't retired. You account for inflation adjusting. All of a sudden, Exxon's balance sheet's about 60% larger. Economic balance sheet's about 60% larger than Apple's. Okay, so now we have operations, cash flow, we have gross investment. From that, we're going to subtract out a capital charge that not only accounts for the return on capital, but kind of an economic depreciation of the company's uh, capital base based on an implied rate of return that's cost of capital. All that kind of gives us a spread. Conceptually, it boils down to kind of an ROI minus the cost of capital. The details, we end up doing a lot of different adjustments. So it's what we call an economic margin. That says is a company creating or destroying value with every investment it makes. So we start with that. And then we start to project out a company's reinvestment rate based on what it's doing with its capital structure, what it's been doing historically, what it's doing with its ability to generate free cash flow, what the what the implied retirements are of its, of its existing gross plant. We then project out a reinvestment rate. The third piece is this concept that we systematized in 90, somewhere between 95 and, and 96 called an economic profit horizon. So one of the big problems with traditional valuation approaches is you spend all this time working out your five-year forecast, you have a great forecast for five years, then you're like, now what? This thing goes out into infinity. So biggest development in kind of security analysis over the last 50 years has been the Gordon growth model, right? Mathematically, a super elegant way to take that last year of cash flow, provided you think it's a normalized cash flow number and capitalize it into perpetuity. You guys have been around a long time. You're not that you're not as old as me, but you've been around a while. You're not 22 either. So you've seen a lot of companies that have gone bankrupt over the years. Paying out to infinity is a long time, <laughs> right? It's a long time to pay out for anyone to earn any kind of positive rate of return above their cost of capital. So we've always thought that was kind of strange. So we created a model that says we're going to take excess returns down to zero over time. And conceptually, you know, you can think of a consumer company as somebody that's going to last a long time. And you can think of a cyclical company as someone that we're going to take to zero very quickly, right? So that's this economic profit horizon concept. And then at the cost of capital level, we have a macro overall cost of capital that's set kind of by the overall economy. Um, we then adjust that at a firm specific level for size and leverage. So in our view of the world, risk, and going back to the investment factor, our view of the world is that the riskiest firm to own is the smallest, most highly levered firm in the stock market. That If we had to, someone put a gun to our head and said, give us the riskiest firm, we would screen the database and that would be our contender. Shoot us or not, that's, that's our view of the world. We think Whenever you have big disruptions in the economy, the small, most highly levered firms always seem to take the brunt of it, right? The least risky firms, the one that we give the, the greatest benefit of the doubt to with cost of capital, the largest, most unlevered firms. So those four factors we've systematically modeled uh, every, every week going back to 1995 for U.S. companies, and then in the early 90s, we added global companies. So we've been doing these 
valuations with this approach for 20,000 stocks a week uh, going back to 98 for U.S. companies and then the international ones later. So we've done this over 20 million times. We have a, a really super deep data set of our estimates of intrinsic value for stocks, where they've traded, what the convergence is. Uh, before we ever did any academic research, there were some researchers out of University of Michigan back in the mid-90s that asked us for our data set, and they actually studied on average how long they used our estimate of intrinsic value as intrinsic value, and then said, well, what does it take for prices to converge to intrinsic value? And what, what they found was about 15% a year. We never, we haven't updated their their metrics for that study, but it seems like a pretty reasonable number from what we've seen over time. You, you talked about intangible assets, and you talked about how you, you know, you you capitalize R and D, and you know that's a big subject of debate right now within value investing. Is that you know one of the reasons value models have gotten things so wrong is because they're not accounting for these intangible assets. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, we've had we had Partha Mohan Ram on the podcast, and he talked about you know Baruch Lev's work, which you you just talked about as well. What do you think about should these intangible assets be on the standard balance sheet that's reported you know publicly, or is this something that investors like us should adjust for on our own? Um, do you think this is something companies should be reporting out on balance sheets, or, or do you think we, we should be you know, smart enough to adjust for this ourselves? So I think there's two pieces to this, right? One is, do you have an intangible that gives you a benefit longer than a year or two years? Because if, if like advertising, a lot of studies will show, okay, the benefit of an advertising expense is a year or two years, but you have to keep doing it, right? It's, it's, it's an ongoing expense. If that's the case, there's really nothing to capitalize. So I, I think taking a machete to this notion of intangibles is is not the right approach. I think also just adding intangibles back to the balance sheet is a little problematic because Google's intangible or Alphabet's intangible that it spends on R&D versus Macy's. These have wildly different value implications, right? Intangibles to me, R&D, Really, let's focus on R&D because I think that's usually the, the one that's easiest to link up to future cash flow generation activities. The intangibles, I think, you know, the approach of taking some percent of SG&A and calling it an intangible for a firm, I think is just, I don't think that's a very good approach. But for sake of completeness, we actually replicated. There was a study that came out by uh, Arno and Harvey that did that, where they took 30% of intangibles and passed R&D and they added it to book value and then reformed book to price portfolios. I think they called it the IHML portfolio. Marginally improved the ability to segment out returns. But again, if you account for intrinsic value, book val intangible adjusted book value does not build nice portfolios. It does, it does marginally better on small caps. In the large cap universe, it doesn't do well at all. But the problem is you can't just add intangibles back and assume it's, or add R&D back and assume it's a dollar of value, dollar for dollar. You're missing the performance measurement part of the equation. So we, we go through a lot of lengths to calculate an economic margin because in order to understand what a firm's worth, we believe first you have to really answer what, how well is the firm performing. You need to answer that and understand that question well in our minds before you can attempt to say what is the firm worth. So I think you need to take the R&D, and if you're going to do intangibles, you need to put it in the context of a performance metric and link that to a way to value the firm. Just adding it back, maybe it improves it some. Conceptually, I think it's just it's not complete. Yeah, and like you said, you know, with, with your Macy's example, it can be really tough to figure out, you know, using an extreme example of like a biotech firm, you know, if they spend money on R&D, it might be worth 100x what they spent, it might be worth zero. So it's, it's very, very hard to figure out, you know, how, how do you value these things um, when, when you look at them from that perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, the important thing is to have the transparency so investors can make the adjustment. I'm not sure constantly adding things back to the balance sheet is always and, and explicitly making the accounting statements more and more complex is the right answer from a FASB perspective. I think the transparency is good so investors can access it if they want to. Trying to plug all the holes and make the financial number perfect, I think, gives a false sense of security. There are, there are a lot of guys out there who've criticized value investing. There are not many, though, that I've found that actually created their own five-factor model um, and wrote their own white paper to support it. Um, and we, we've talked about some of your factors already, but I was just wondering at a very high level, could you sort of talk about your five-factor model and how, it, you know, how, how the results were relative to some of the other models out there? Sure. So I think this is, this is a pretty interesting aspect of what we did. 
Uh, the five factors are the market factor, which is common to every asset pricing model as far as I know, the size factor, those, those remain the same. We introduced three new, approach, three new factors. One, the intrinsic value factor. In other words, going back to our earlier example, how far away from intrinsic value is a stock? So we'd formed you know, zero market portfolios on the most undervalued and most overvalued portfolios as a factor. The second one was financing yield, getting back to this wealth creation concept. What are firms doing with their money? Are they returning capital? Are they acquiring capital? So this notion of uh, <clears throat> stewardship. And the third is the concept of leverage. You know, to us, book to, book to price, we agree it should be compensated over time because to us it's a book to price conflates so many different things. That's what makes it such a tricky variable, right? Mathematically, you can have a company that has high rates of return. It will trade at a higher book to price, even though it might be fairly valued, right? It might be undervalued and trade at a higher book to price than a low return company. Companies with a lot of leverage are going to trade at different book to price ratios, depending on whether they're profitable or not, than companies with low leverage. So book to price conflates a lot of things, but ultimately to us, it's sort of a proxy for leverage. So we, we, instead of using book to price, we use leverage, which is what our research from 95 showed us is consistently priced into the market. So that five factor model, we then applied to all the extant factors that seem to be popular, the HML, momentum, volatility, gross profitability, the investment factor. The interesting thing is all of them basically were subsumed by this more parsimonious model. All of them had insignificantly, uh, alpha insignificantly, statistically insignificantly different than zero, basically. Conversely, if we applied our factors to the existing models, such as the investment factor, the financing yield factor, the debt factor, the, the leverage factor, there are a lot of technical nuances in there. It and book to price are highly correlated. So we'll just focus on the first two. But incorporating those or running those through kind of existing alpha models, both of those variables, regardless of the model specification, five, three, five, six, seven, whatever, highly significant alpha. They're definitely capturing something the academic community has never thought about. Some people will say you're shoving a lot of factors into one. That's not the case at all. Valuation is a very different type of factor than profitability or the investment. The investment factor is anti-valuation because it doesn't it doesn't handle wealth compounding well. I mean, it, the investment factor results from not understanding valuation. So it's a very different very different set of properties, and we think it's it's kind of an interesting contribution. I noticed you have size in your model, and I wanted to ask you just generally about size. There seem to be three camps on size right now. One is that there is no size premium. Two is that there is a size premium. And three is, you know, well, there's not a size premium, but all the other factors work better in small caps. So, you know, size enhances everything else. And I'm wondering where you sort of fall on that. You know, we've our, our work has always identified that size needs to be paid for. So, in other words, whenever we look at uh, groups of stocks and we forecast out the same cash flows we do to value them from an intrinsic value perspective and sometimes we just back into implied rates of return, right? S portfolios of smaller stocks always have a higher implied rate of return using all of our other valuation, keeping all of our other valuation technology constant, so to speak. So we, we consistently see that smaller cap stocks demand some sort of extra compensation in the marketplace. So we believe small is a risk that needs to be paid for over time. I have two um, questions. I'm going to completely go off script here um, before I let Jack kind of bring us bring us uh, into the home stretch. But the first is, and it just kind of got me thinking, like you've been running your intrinsic value model on roughly 20,000 companies for 20 years, let's say, maybe even longer than that, going back to 95 with the US and then global, I think you said, um, late 90s, early 2000s. So, and I think you had mentioned on the Odd Lots podcast that there has been instances where things either look extremely under or overvalued. So I just wanted maybe to give you an opportunity. I know you're not m making macro calls here or anything like that. It's really a bottoms up system, but it is interesting to think about how these intrinsic values can be aggregated and you might be able to look at that at an overall market valuation sort of level. And then, you know, I'm wondering, like, what are you seeing today? What does, you know, are we extremely overvalued, fairly valued or I don't know, undervalued? Right. Great point. And it, it's something that we're asked many times. 
So you're right. As a firm, we tend to be bottom up. We don't really fancy ourselves as being macro type folks. Um, and in fact, kind of our, our flagship product is sector neutral because we don't we don't really deviate from what we do, which is we want to find the best price stocks within a group of stocks. So we, we try to pick within sectors and, and stay sector neutral that way. But as a firm, there's been four times in our history that we've actually made market calls, three that we've made explicitly and one that was just kind of implicit just by the research we were sending out. I got earlier, we were speaking about Cisco. If you looked at our data in 2000, you would see growth stocks were uh, large growth was obscenely priced. You take all the tech names and throw that in the bubble. That was the Cisco. We think it's worth 14. It's trading 80 phenomenon. We didn't make any kind of a macro call then, but clearly all our work was saying things are out of whack. And when we were looking and we'd construct portfolios, we were constantly gravitated towards small cap value. 2008, we made an explicit call. We wrote a research report called Then and Now, which basically said back then your dentist was giving you stock picks as he was shooting you up with uh, Novocaine. And now no one, if you mention stocks, people run from you. We thought the 2008, end of 2008 into 2009 just represented a great opportunity to be in equities. We never made another market call until March of 2020. We kind of dusted off the then and now and wrote another research report then and now again saying, we don't know what's going to happen pandemic wise. We don't know if the world's going to end, but if it's not going to end, you really should be pretty actively invested in stocks. And then we had one more call in August through this year, basically saying the market's expensive. Unlike 2020, you know, it's not that value is cheap anymore, but value just statistically is out of whack relative to growth. And we retracted that call about two weeks ago saying, you know, value and growth statistically seem to be much more in line now. So we think the easy money has been had on the value side. Um, value may very well outperform based on, you know, another piece of this thing that value tends to conflate is duration, I think, right? It's these, these uh, low return, low growth stocks tend to have low duration higher profitability, higher growth stocks tend to have higher duration, throw in the financial piece, this increasing, uh, the, the, the worries about increasing interest rates is a great catalyst for value. If, if interest rates stop increasing, you know, the growth value thing isn't so interesting. If interest rates keep increasing, value is probably going to do relatively better. We don't, we don't have a, we don't have a problem with that. It makes perfect sense to us, but we don't think there's a great discrepancy at this point. And we don't buy into the theory that returns have to have some sort of catch up. You know, the notion that expected returns have a memory is just crazy. Expected returns are a function today of your intrinsic value, your cost of capital and the market price that determines what your expected return is going forward. Just because you've underperformed in the past, it's it's crazy to think you're going to outperform in the future. It's like a roll of the dice. You may not have seen 12 for 100 rolls, but doesn't mean it's going to be more likely to come up on the next roll. Well, three out of four on the uh, the macro market calls are pretty pretty decent. So even though that's not your bread and butter, that's uh that's pretty good. You know what? It's just it's we're just Mr. Obvious, honestly. We don't claim any we don't claim any skill there, but things just get out of whack, so we just kind of send a note. But certainly, we think the bottom up data can be used in that regard when it's very obvious. We certainly can't trade around it. In any significant way, it's more just a strategic consideration. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is a little bit kind of coming down to the portfolio level. And so as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong with any of these details, but you, you run a number of, you run some mutual funds, you run some SMAs, and it looks like you're holding roughly, let's say, 50 securities. Um, that score highest um, through your intrinsic value score when added. And there's sort of a process you go through. It seems to me there's like a heavy quantitative process up front, and then there is some discretionary in the final um, say of when a stock gets added. But my question is a little bit more around your sell strategy, which how do you determine um, when is it like a band? Like if, if you if you have a stock in the portfolio and it's like 50 percent about I don't know, because I know these are pretty low turnover strategies, which is good. Um, but, you know, how do you go about 
um, determining the cell candidates in the portfolio and sort of what, what is the process behind that? I'm gonna just gonna back up just a tad and provide a little color on, on, the, on, the, on the setup you, you mentioned. So in the, in the strategy space, we run a small cap strategy that is 99% quantitative. There's a qualitative overlay just in case there's weird stuff happening to the company or what have you, but it's, it's basically uh, quantitative. That's our small cap strategy. We have that in a fund and an SMA. The, the product you're referring to is what we call the valuation 50. And it has exactly 50 names all the time, which makes the cell discipline very important. Okay. And I think one of the things that uh, this particular product is, I think, an interesting mix of quantitative and qualitative in the sense that uh, we use the quantitative aspect to define and take a broad list of stocks down to a group of about 150 names that our analysts then use to construct the portfolio. The sell discipline comes in place when either the analyst, the analyst then takes every one of those stocks and remodels and builds out their own pro formas versus just using the uh, our systematic set of pro forma statements. The analyst then builds out their own pro formas, comes up with their own intrinsic value. And this is where the fun starts because that's where attention comes. We have, we kind of think of it as we have analysts that put a very hard check on a quantitative model and a quantitative model puts a hard check on the analyst. When a stock falls below the 50th percentile in its particular grouping, that triggers a conversation for the investment committee. Either the model has identified maybe an analyst is unduly falling in love with the stock and needs to sell it, or the analyst is identifying problems that aren't yet reflected in the financials, and that then triggers a debate. And the reason you know, we can run a strategy like that quantitatively. What the analysts have brought to the table after having run this strategy for the last 17 years is on average, we tend to hold these names about 12 years. And a, a, a big chunk of our turnover is caused as a result of acquisitions. We always feel we're being underpaid to give up our names, but you know, that's, that's the way every portfolio manager feels when they're having to sell a stock they own. But, uh, you know, I'd say probably 20% of our turnover has been a result of acquisitions. Some of it has been a result of uh, sector reclassifications through, through time, because again, we stay sector neutral. So if, if a stock gets moved from sector A to sector B, if it doesn't look good relative to stocks in sector B, we have to get rid of it. But the sell discipline results from valuation and then the, the tension between a default answer putting a check on an analyst and an analyst putting a check on the default answer. The group of us have been together running this model and this investment committee uh, since 2004. So we have our analysts, our industry specialists and sector specialists, myself and Dan O'Bricky who started the company, we're more on the valuation side and the curmudgeon people that just kind of pick at the scab and, and push back on any, any action anyone wants to make and then the committee votes and it has to be a majority to, to push something through one way or the other. I just had one more before we wrap up. Um, you know, you've obviously created a very thoughtful model here. And, and one of the things we struggle with, and I think a lot of people who run quantitative systematic strategies struggle with is this balance between long-term data and the fact that sometimes things change in the market. And so, you know, price to book was an example. I mean, obviously we're, we're both probably pretty negative on price to book, but you know, there was a lot of data to support price to book for a long period of time. And then you had, you had a situation where maybe because of intangible assets or because of whatever, something changed. And so I'm wondering how you think about that. You know, when you see something in your model that maybe you're starting to question and saying, maybe the world's changed, you know, maybe I need to adjust my model. How do you think about that balance between long-term data and sort of what's changed in the market? Right. So for us, the issue hasn't really been as much changes in the marketplace. I think we've, we took a long time to kind of sit down and put this framework together. And we'd already worked in the, in, in the financial uh, modeling sector before. So we kind of had a, a, a solid idea of what we wanted to do when we constructed this economic margin framework. But things that do change are the way data is reported, uh, the way financial uh, standards are interpreted and reported. So as I mentioned, since 95, we've been capitalizing operating leases. And FASB recently came out and started having companies capitalize operating leases. So the question is, do we want to use FASB's number or do we want to use our number? Well, we think FASB kind of got it wrong. So one of the changes that we had to make is we literally have to go through the balance sheets and 
strip out the capitalized lease numbers so that we're not double counting and then we bring the numbers kind of take the financial statements and, and bring them back a level that's a new adjustment we had to make so that we can kind of put back our our view of how we're capitalizing leases onto the gross our kind of economic balance sheet if you will the way we do it so we haven't had the issue of kind of a big change in the marketplace versus us but i think one of the things that happens often is markets are very emotional right i mean we like to think of the efficient market hypothesis hypothesis dominating everything but you know we know there's tons of anomalies that are not explained by market efficiency market efficiency sort of intellectually flourished back in the days when when the test revolved around do current prices reflect all past price information and then now we've reached the point that momentum variables are in asset pricing models. So the entire notion of fleshing out market efficiency has done a full circle since the 1960s, right? Now momentum is, is in asset pricing models, which would have been anathema in the 70s if you were a doctoral student. So a lot of these things change. Our view has pretty much stayed the same. We know we believe in net present value. Uh, our view of risk hasn't changed. We believe it's important to have some handle on not having perpetuities it's it's important to, to re respect the effects of competition but markets get out of whack in 2000 i didn't know if we were going to be around in 20, 2000 and you know two because we knew you don't want to be arrogant because the market's super smart right uh, doyle brunson said poker is a hard way to make an easy living and certainly it applies to portfolio management the market's super smart and you don't want to be arrogant but we thought what we did was thoughtful and right and you know we just that we just gotta we gotta grit through this because we just feel eventually it's gonna come back around we never apologized for anything we did we took our lumps and certainly we had a lot of lumps then because you, you couldn't have shown well if you're out of all the large cap tech stocks it's just impossible right but and then there are other periods going into the financial crisis where you had financial stocks were running so much and we couldn't own those, you know? So we did well when things kind of blew up in the financial crisis, but leading up to it, we had some really difficult reporting periods. You don't get it right all the time, but the question is, do you have confidence in your base approach to the market? It's just a philosophy and it's, you know, we don't think, uh, we don't think valuation should dominate any portfolio, but we think every portfolio should be exposed to it, you know? And if you had, from our perspective and, this is our view. If we had to pick one style, it would probably it would obviously be a valuation approach. You folks have a lot of experience and expertise implementing different ways of interpreting data, and you'd have a different answer, and that's fine. I mean, I think that's what makes this business so fun, the fact that we constantly get marked to market. You know, it's, are you made of chicken shit or chicken salad? Over time, the market's going to tell you. <laughs> if that's what's great about it. That's great, Raphael. Thank you. This has been uh, This has been a really... Good discussion. I, I mean, I think, I think the point you know where we started was sometimes in investing you can stray sort of too far away from core sort of first principle type concepts. And I think what you guys are doing with trying to estimate intrinsic value and find stocks and buy stocks for less than they're worth is just a fundamentally sound approach. And the fact that you've got sort of a systematic model doing a lot of the heavy lifting it introduces you know consistency and repeatability in the process. And obviously, you've been doing it for a very long time without a sample data, which is, which is very important um, and, and really, really good to see. So if people want to learn more about your firm, your research, what you guys are working on, your funds, where can they go to find out more? Uh, uh, thank you for the, thank you for that as a, a cabbage softball <laughs> set up to hit out of the park. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, go to appliedfinance.com. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter called the valuation called at appliedfinance.com. You can sign up for Valuation Edge which uh, basically every month I ramble. The other people on the team actually write really thoughtful, coherent pieces. You get my ramblings and their insights uh, once a month. I think it's, it's a nice little package of staying on top of the valuation research. Uh, as, as you mentioned, we have funds. They're under the applied finance name. We're really excited. We're going to launch our first ETF. Hopefully it comes out uh, in May. And uh, we're very excited about that. It's going to be a very broad market-based ECF drawing off of those the intrinsic value and the wealth creation stewardship principles we discussed in our white paper. But 
Thank you guys so much for having me. It was This has been a lot of fun. Hopefully we can do this again. Thank you. This is great. We have a podcast someday. I hope you guys come on ours. For sure. Thank you. We'd be happy to. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for joining. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.